Hello, everyone. Good, uh, good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with all of you uh, today, and congratulations to the NRI Institute on 25 years. Let's give them a big round of applause. It's truly stunning because um, I know how hard it is with Indian organizations. If you have one Indian organization, it will very soon be three or five Indian organizations. Uh, everybody likes to be president, vice president, secretary general, but you've held together and had one, one organization, which is just uh, spectacular. I thought I would spend a little time reflecting on, on the idea of NRIs and lessons for global Indians from India as well as the other way around. I am a professor at Columbia University and I hope this is the first of many opportunities for us to interact. I've been teaching at Columbia for 20 years and I am the university's new chief digital officer where I'm working on issues about how education is changing and I believe that India and Indians will have an important role to play in that. As it turns out, Indians are already doing a lot in this issue. You may have heard of something called Khan Academy. How many of you have heard of this, Khan Academy? A few. Everybody will hear about it. It's like the day you first heard of Google and then everybody heard of Google, right? So Khan Academy, only a few of you have heard of, but everybody's going to hear of it. It's run by a guy who's half Indian, half Bangladeshi, and his name is Salman Khan. It's the different Salman Khan. <laughs> and the big Salman Khan will be shocked to know that one day he will be known as the other Salman Khan. Because this man, what he's doing, he's changing the world. He's known more as Sal Khan. Uh, what he's doing is he's running a website called KhanAcademy.org where you can go and get free lessons on everything from mathematics to art history to science and it's just changing the way America and then soon the world is going to be educated. So please look out for uh, Sal Khan and the work he's doing. It's just one example of the enormous success, as you know, NRIs have had uh, uh, around the world. And it's very close to what I do as an online as somebody who's interested in education. I've been reading for the last uh, few days a book called Darbar by Tavleen Singh. Some of you may know her name. She's a columnist here in Delhi. And not all of you may agree with her politics and her attitude about modern India. This is a very gossipy book, which is what Tav Tavleen is. That's, that's Tavleen. That's what she's known for. But why I, I, I mention it is that I recommend it for people who are not used to coming back to India and are, are kind of new to today's India. Because what she talks about in the 70s, in the 1970s, is how different India was to what it is today. In the 1970s, she has this great line where she says, Indians of all levels accepted things that we wouldn't accept today. So she has this line where she says, even the richest Indians lived in genteel decay. What she meant is that it was acceptable in New Delhi, very close to here, that you could be a very rich man, very rich family, but you would accept that water would be available only two hours a day. That you would accept that electricity would be cut several hours a day. That you would be, you would be happy driving a car that was actually first created in 1947 or before that. It was just accepted. But what has changed in the last 25, 30 years, and especially in the last uh, 20 years, is the aspirations of Indians. And Indians not just at the very top level, but Indians at every level no longer accept what was the status quo. And that I think is a very good, exciting opportunity for NRIs as well as Indians, because that means there are more opportunities to invest, there are more opportunities to work together, and that's something that's going to have a big impact. My interest in, uh, in NRIs and our success comes from being an NRI myself, but my father and my uncle have both been Indian ambassadors. My uncle, uh, T.P. Sitaram, is currently India's High Commissioner to, the Mo uh, to, Mo uh, to Mauritius. And so if any of you are from there, I, I would love to say hello. And through them, I have seen what it's like to be an NRI. We talked about some of the successes of NRIs, but my father was India's High Commissioner to Fiji when there were the military coups took place. So I have seen the challenges of being Indian overseas. In Fiji, as you may know, what happened is the majority Indian population 
helped elect a, uh, a, a government in 1987, 1988, and there was a coup which was basically in, uh, in anger about the rising political powers of, of uh, the Indian population, the native Indian, the local Indian population. And that showed me that one of the best things that can happen in gatherings like this is that we stay united and connect the 20 million or so Indians in the, in the diaspora. We can learn about this and how it's done from the Chinese and some other diaspora groups, which I think hasn't been done yet enough in other places. One of the other uh, things that I have noticed uh, being at Columbia is how Indians are allowing their and encouraging their children to, tie, to try other things. We have a friend here who's a designer who will be talking to you later from Amsterdam. That's an example of a profession that hasn't always been seen as a great career path for Indians. And I can tell you this as a journalist. I announced to my parents when I was 12 that I was going to be a journalist and they started crying immediately. Uh, we have an organization called SAJA, South Asian Journalists Association in New York. SAJA.org if you ever want to take a look. And we like to say we have a thousand members, that means we have a thousand parents who are crying because their children are journalists. Uh, but what has happened through Saja, and Saja is about 18 years old, is through this organization we have now seen Indians in positions of power in America outside the traditional ways in which Americans have been known in places like, uh, Indians have been known in places like America medicine, Wall Street, all of that has happened. But now we're seeing in journalism, for example, the world's largest news website is run by an Indian named Jay Singh. The Los Angeles Times is run by an Indian named Devan Maharaj. National Public Radio in, in, in America, which is the largest radio uh, enterprise, is run by a woman named Madhulika Sikha, who is, an, who is a migrant twice removed because she's actually from London. So they hired this Indian from London to come to America and run the radio system there. And then from, we have so many other examples like that. One of my favorite examples is Fareed Zakaria, who you know uh, was born in Bombay and for, he is America's number one explainer of the world to America. So imagine the situation that there is a Muslim born in Bombay who is explaining America to the world and explaining the world to America. So, as we look around, there are so many ways in which we're seeing Indians in new ways and being in successful in new places. I think that's very uh, exciting. But I do want to leave you with the thought, especially in America, we're also starting to see Indians make headlines for the wrong reasons. On a regular basis, you might see Indians on Wall Street, in business, in other... Uh, other um, fields of work who have gotten in trouble with the law. This used to not happen. In some ways, it's a sign of maturity when your Indians show up in the sports pages and the crime pages. But of course, we would prefer they didn't show up in the crime pages. But it does raise the question of, are we, as we're raising our children and thinking about these issues, are we doing enough to understand the ethics and the rules of the countries we live in? And that's something that I think we should, be, uh, we should be thinking more about. But I want to, of course, leave you on a positive note and just to say that uh, you also know that the gentleman who is the most successful prosecutor in the United States in the last dozen years, who has been responsible for putting more pressure on terrorism and financial uh, shenanigans in, uh, in America, is a gentleman named Preet Bharara. Uh, Preet is the U.S. attorney in, in Manhattan, which means it's, he's the most high-profile law enforcement official in uh, certain circles. And he is an Indian, and we're very proud of what he has been doing as well. So my message to a gathering like this, where I'm very humbly uh, grateful to have the opportunity to share some, uh, share, share some thoughts, is that we are just getting started. These 20 million Indians around the world are going to continue to be successful, continue to have an impact. Because I see the young Indians in American universities and what they're doing. But it's going to be with all of our cooperation, with all of us working together, with organizations like NRI Institute, that we're going to see the success. 
I want to leave you with my email address if I can ever help you with anything. My email address is very easy. It's Sri, S-R-E-E, at Sri.net. Not Sri.com. Sri.com is a chain of motels in Florida. And uh, I, uh, if I can ever help you with anything, please do uh, get in touch. And I wish you the very best in all you're doing and for today's program. Thank you very much, everybody.